muted. So good morning everybody, um, my name is Rosie, um, I'm the organiser of this webinar this morning, The Future of UK Solar. Um, I'm delighted to be joined um, by Alan John from Osborne Clark, Seb Berry, Solar Century, Merlin Hyman from Regen Southwest and Jonathan Selwyn from Lark Energy. Um, and I think we've got a great discussion ahead of us. Um, just a couple of things to note before we begin. Um, there's a questions box um, on the right hand side of the screen so please do type type up and send in questions for our speakers um, as we go and, and there'll be a, a 20 minutes at the end for, for those questions to get asked. Um, the format today will be um, that each uh, speaker will present for 10 to 15 minutes um, and then we'll have the discussion following that. Um, and also the, the webinar will be recorded so you'll be able to listen back and share with uh, friends and colleagues um, sort of post event. But for now I think, just, just to start from me, I think many of us in the industry knew that um, cuts were on the horizon um, but perhaps what wasn't underestimated was the severity that we are seeing proposed. Um, although recently there has been you know, opposition to the proposals even from within the, the, the Tory party itself, um, from Boris Johnson, from Julian Stroud and others. Um, here at Solar Power Portal we're running um, a campaign building a British solar future that's covering the latest policy um, and announcements and, and, and putting forward responses both in-house and from, from guest bloggers so, so check that out. And finally I think I'd just like to also mention that in October um, our Solar Energy UK exhibition and we'll be running various sessions on business diversification, international markets, communications, lobbying, and much, much more. So do, do register for that if you haven't already. That's Solar Energy UK. So where does that all leave us? Well, this morning um, I'm going to just hand straight over to, to the expert speakers that we have with us. Um, and we'll start with um, Alan, who's going to um, really... I guess just put forward his ideas um, for what we should be doing as an industry moving forward um, and some of the uh, recent announcements um, that we've been hearing this summer. So Alan, I'm going I'm to hand over to you now.
Hi, Alan. Um, it looks like you haven't entered the audio pin, hash 100 hash. Um, so whilst you do that, I'm going to hand over to you, Jonathan, um, because it seems that, that you have done that. So Jonathan, if you'd just like to start, start now. Uh, good morning. Yes, <laughs> sorry, I was uh, uh, waiting for the, uh, the first um, presentation. So um, I don't want to uh, steal anyone's thunder because um, obviously I was expecting to go a little bit later. Um, but I think from our perspective, um, we were expecting um, something quite uh, strong in terms of the uh, consultation. Um, I think we were expecting some severe cuts and we expected it from January. I know a lot of people were thinking that it was uh, nothing was going to be happening until uh, March, but um, the way the government was uh, talking and uh, not talking, in fact, and uh, uh, the way they were answering some of the questions we were putting to them uh, through this uh, trade association, um, we expected them to do something rather rushed and to repeat the same sort of approach they took with the RO last year. Um, so we were expecting something quite bad. Um, we obviously had the RO announcement again in uh, the summer, which was um, pretty terrible for those in the large-scale industry, um, in particular the um, approach to grandfathering, which is a cornerstone of uh, investor confidence. Um, and so um, we were preparing for a, a bit of a rearguard action, but of course uh, none of us expected to uh, see such severe um, proposals in there. I think from our point of view, um, there's a number of uh, actions um, that we as an industry and us as a company are uh, pretty much focused on at the moment. And I won't go into too much detail because I know some of my fellow panelists will be speaking more about some of the other issues. Um, but first of all, lobbying is absolutely key. And I think for the first time, our industry has got the government a bit on the back foot here. Uh, you know, the industry has developed hugely um, since the uh, origins of the feeding tariff. Of course, some companies were very active even before the feed-in tariff, but certainly the momentum um, since 2010 um, with the industry delivering um, 8 gigawatts. I don't think anyone would have expected the industry to have reached that milestone, um, certainly not by uh, 2015. Um, and um, the industry is very broad. Uh, the um, Obviously, emphasis from time to time focuses on the large scale with the uh, large scale investor community, the developers and the EPCs. Um, but equally, we have um, nearly 800,000 installations in total, many of which, of course, are at the domestic level. Um, the one part of the market that hasn't really taken off yet is uh, the commercial, the mid-scale market, as it's called. And um, I think we're all expecting to see that really uh, get going this year. And it has uh, started to get going, but of course, this uh, consultation is going to hamper that quite significantly. Um, so um, we are in a very different place than we were um, when we had the other shocks to the industry, whether it was the original uh, large-scale cut in 2011, the uh, later illegal action in 2011, um, the RO closures and so on. Um, we're in a better shape as an industry to fight this, and uh, we have more natural supporters out there, not least the uh, many people who've got uh, solar installed. So I think lobbying this time around is going to have much more of an impact, and I think the government uh, getting into a bit of a mess at the moment with uh, things like fracking and certainly nuclear, as you would have seen in the news. There's a lot of opposition even in the government's own ranks. Um, so I'm not going to say too much about lobbying, but I think that's uh, actually going to be a very strong element of what we do to fight um, these proposals. Um, legal action, um, though some of you might know that um, we've been involved with Solar Sentry and others uh, in fighting the RO uh, from last year, and we're still in an appeal stage with that. Um, and um, there's no doubt that government do take notice of legal actions. We only have to look at the original 2011 FIT action, which um, showed the uh, government's action was legal, and there's a damages claim which is still ongoing that um, is um, coming up for settlement. So that's a large element of, um, of damages that the government is facing on that. So I think legal action is important, and there will be um, undoubtedly uh, legal action discussions going on, if not uh, action being taken in the courts over probably um, both the RO announcement this year on grandfathering and also um, on the uh, possibly the feed-in tariff pre-accreditation action, which we believe um, the consultation, as many people do, is a sham. So that, that's all uh, very important, uh, keeping up the pressure on government with lobbying and legal action. But equally, as an industry, we have to accept that, um, that, that, that certain elements in the government are pushing for us to 
uh, get off what they call subsidy, what we like to call uh, market correction, but uh, they're pushing for us to get off subsidy sooner rather than later. So a lot of our focus has got to be on how do we bring down the costs of uh, uh, installing solar, whether at the large scale or at the domestic level. And of course, we're rather hamstrung in that uh, respect by the minimum import price on Chinese panels. Um, we believe that um, we're paying around 15% above mar uh, world market rates for panels at the moment. And you are starting to see companies um, finding ways of uh, delivering panels that don't go through the uh, minimum price undertaking. Um, but nevertheless, it's uh, certainly hampering the industry across Europe. And that's another area where we need to uh, lobby government to make uh, the point in Europe that what is the point of uh, trying to protect European manufacturers when there's not a European market because the prices are too high. Um, so um, that, that's very important. But there's no doubt that our prices have continued to come down, albeit not at the same pace that they were when uh, module prices were in free fall. Um, and, um, you know, we're not there yet. We can't deliver... Um, projects yet without any subsidy support except at the margins maybe where people are very, very large energy users, they're paying high energy bills and solar can stack up in its own right and we're already seeing um, some moves by companies uh, to say, well, you know what, um, we might do it anyway even if the uh, feed-in tariff does go. Um, but of course it's a bit of a zero-sum game because if we point out that um, uh, to our customers that actually we can continue even after the feeding tariff either reduces significantly or even ends completely as it might do because of a cap, um, then immediately government will seize on that and say we told you you could do it without any kind of uh, uh, support through the levy control framework. We're just precipitating that and getting you to focus your minds quicker on that. Um, so um, we can't both tell our customers don't worry it will carry on regardless and at the same time say to government well, actually um, you're going to decimate our industry. Um, so it's a very difficult balancing act, but there's no doubt that if the government uh, follows through with its uh, proposals, that there will be a significant hiatus um, whereby one minute we're installing uh, many, many megawatts, uh, the boom as usual created by the government's action, and the next minute um, there's a very sparse work out there um, for the industry. Um, so our, our main... Um, uh, focus, I suppose, is on those three areas, the lobbying, the legal action, and finding a way to reduce our costs significantly. So maybe from some time later in the year, if MIP ever comes off, we will have an industry which can operate without any support through feeding tariff and rock. It's a tall order, and um, it's not going to help us very much, that last uh, uh, element, um, in the very short term. Um, I don't intend to say too much about what um, is going on at the lobbying uh, sort of area and uh, what the government's response seems to be because there's other panellists who are very um, much more uh, in the know on that than I am and I don't want to steal their thunder. So I, I think, um, I can't see the others uh, are on microphone at the moment. Um, can I refer to Agnes to say whether she uh, needs me to um, just say a few more words about um, subsidy free solar or whether we'll come back to that later? Yeah, Jonathan, do, yeah, do carry on. We're just uh, waiting for um, Alan and Merlin to type in their pins. So I'll, I'll give you a heads up when, when that's been done. Okay, fine. Um, just wanted to say a few words about um, Amber Rudd in all of this. Um, uh, any government minister who makes these sorts of proposals is going to come under attack uh, and uh, be called all sorts of names under the sun. And I think I'm not going to in any way excuse the... Uh, proposals that have uh, come forward because they are um, very um, harsh and um, particularly on the grandfather and the RO, um, disastrous for investor confidence. Um, but from my point of view, um, she seems to have been put in to do a job by the Treasury. She's quite close to George Osborne and the job she seems to have been put in to do is to um, close up all of the um, sort of expenditure um, that the government's committed to through the levy control framework or elsewhere. And um, my view is probably um, at some stage prepare the way for debt to be abolished and um, merged into uh, Biz, um, Department of Business, Industry and Skills. Um, and um, 
with that in mind, whether she's got much room for manoeuvre, whether she's been given much room for manoeuvre by the Treasury, is an, uh, a moot point. We had her um, a month or two ago come up and open our phase two solar farm, the first minister ever to visit a solar farm up at the Ketton Cement Works project. And uh, she was uh, she was there for a, a whole morning. She was very engaged with the issue. She seemed to like solar. She repeated her view about the solar revolution. Um, she also used the words that we were um, putting out in our briefing to her about uh, solar being a great British success story. So I'm not convinced that she doesn't believe any of that stuff, but I'm, I'm just not sure, and I'm sure Ted and others will um, sort of enlarge on this as to whether she has absolutely any room for manoeuvre or, or not. The one area where she did show some interest was where whether um, we could do what some of the other world markets do, particularly America, which is focus on tax breaks as a way of incentivizing solar, both at the domestic and commercial level, um, rather than um, have any kind of uh, energy bill mechanism that we have here. And it seems to uh, garner cross-party support in the US. Uh, so uh, Democrats and Republicans seem to be quite comfortable with tax breaks. And indeed, in the UK, um, fracking, uh, other oil and gas exploration, uh, and uh, so on, um, it's the, the mechanism of choice by government is to give tax breaks for exploration and for new technologies to be utilized and so on. So um, leaving aside the importance of lobbying against the severe cuts that are being proposed in the FIT, and uh, in the RO, I think uh, we do need to explore whether there's any other mechanisms that uh, might be more palatable to certain parts of the government um, that uh, we could um, sort of model and look at how it could work to help our industry. And that's mm. probably um, initially in terms of commercial solar, um, but also domestic as well, because more and more people are going to be filling out self-assessment forms in the future, probably everybody eventually. Um, and uh, tax credits and the like are something that has been used before. Good. Okay, Jonathan, thank you very much. Um, we've had some really interesting questions come through so far. Um, but what I'm going to do actually is hand straight over to Alan so that we can get his uh, point of view. And then, as I said previously, we'll take questions at the end. So, um, Alan, delighted that uh, we've sorted out that technical glitch and I'm uh, handing over to you now. Thank you very much indeed, and apologies that uh, I must have been on mute um, earlier on. Um, I was going to say a few words about um, the particular proposals um, uh, and the background um, to the uh, legislative changes that are being proposed, but in, in a sense, um, I'm taking them as read. I think the industry is um, very well aware um, of, uh, of what is proposed. I think we've each crawled through the painful detail um, of what's in the various consultations, uh, and I think just picking up a theme that, uh, that Jonathan touched upon, um, uh, the assumption would be um, that while there will be changes, and important changes on areas of concern that will be lobbied against um, over the next few weeks and months, uh, and, and that's what the industry must press for, the assumption will be uh, that there will indeed be um, material changes, material uh, cuts to, to subsidy and to the regime uh, that has helped um, the solar industry get to where it is um, today. The slightly unfortunate thing um, uh, I've taken, I, I think, from the uh, FIT consultation in particular is maybe the tone of the consultation, there's almost a sense that it's the uh, end of term report, or possibly a mid term report, um, uh, on um, a, a, a class of, uh, uh, of students um, who have actually overperformed and over delivered and over deployed. And there's almost a sense um, of being um, told off and being chastised um, for over delivering um, against um, particular targets. Um, there's another sense, very much very strongly, uh, that um, the measures proposed, and they are very swinging measures um, from um, tariff cuts um, through to, to caps, um, through to potential changes to the export tariff, um, uh, that if those aren't enough, um, then more uh, will be coming to ensure um, that the levy control framework pot um, is kept um, sacrosanct. Uh, it's, it's a tone uh, that, that, that says, you know, we're, we're, we're going to finish this off, um, and uh, it, it is uh, particularly challenging. Um, uh, you know, all power to everybody's elbow in terms of the, the lobbying that will be going on, but I think it is absolutely right um, that, that we should be looking 
well ahead um, to, as, as far as possible, cope uh, with a new regime um, which is ultimately going to be subsidy free um, and in the short term um, is going to be um, a, a, a much reduced um, sub subsidy regime. Um, in terms, therefore, of the title um, of this webinar, I think just let's remind ourselves it is the future of UK solar. So forgive me if I perhaps skip um, the next three to six months um, where there will be a hiatus um, caused by these changes if they come through. Uh, and everybody, of course, is, is madly planning um, uh, to, to ensure the projects get across the line by, by particular deadlines. But if we can look perhaps um, beyond that um, into, into the following year and beyond Beyond. And just looking perhaps at some constructive um, new business models that may come through and that are being uh, very carefully um, uh, thought through at the moment. I, I've been having a series of strategic conversations across the industry with people who are trying to make things work. It's, it's hugely challenging uh, and I don't know if anybody has actually got ultimate answers and those answers will vary according to which part of the supply chain, uh, which part of the industry um, your business is located in. Uh, but those conversations are happening. There's nothing like uh, a dramatic subsidy cut to force innovation and to force people to think outside the box uh, and to really press forward with alternative business models. Um, protecting and enhancing and if you like sweating existing assets, there's 10 billion pounds worth at least um, of, of solar assets having been installed and, and up and running uh, in the UK. That asset class needs to be looked after, needs to be uh, dealt with in, in an efficient and cost effective um, O&M way. Um, there's a lot of exploited unused grid capacity um, at sites where of course the maximum export is very rarely achieved uh, and certainly there, there's a lot of interesting conversations around co-siting of generation. Um, storage, of course, will come back to uh, as, as a huge potential opportunity to ensure that an existing asset, which is out there but underused, um, is actually used in a smarter, cleverer way so as to squeeze more value um, out of existing sites. Uh, repowerings and retrofitting um, of existing assets um, is, again, something that is going to, I'm sure, be a, a really important factor uh, for the industry to uh, to, 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 to cope with uh, and, to, and to thrive on. Um, uh, these assets, of course, um, as with any form of technology, after 5, 10, 15 years, it, 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 it will be capable of improvement and enhancement. And I think that's an exciting way forward. Um, there, uh, apart from existing assets, though, uh, there are completely new business models um, which will need to be developed um, uh, so as to press the, uh, the solar industry forward um, over the next um, particularly two or two or three years. Um, I think we can expect um, the building of, um, as it were, brown extensions um, to existing um, green um, accredited sites. Now, there are regulatory challenges with that. There are metering challenges with that. Um, but broadly, certainly the RO regime um, uh, anticipates that that excluded capacity, as it's called under that regime, um, will indeed, can indeed, um, uh, be built out um, without affecting the accreditation of the original RO accredited plant. Um, and where there are economies of scale, um, uh, possibly extending with a brown extension um, uh, may be something where it is permitted with, uh, with grid capacity uh, and, and with um, planning and, uh, and, uh, and land consents. Um, dual schemes, um, uh, quite possibly, um, will be pressed forward. It depends very much on the, the dual schemes with CFDs. Of course, that uh, begs the question if, if CFDs come through uh, for the benefit of solar. Um, uh, but again, um, that is something that uh, we might expect to see develop. Similarly, FIT schemes, if the regulatory regime can be clarified as to, um, indeed, whether you can add a brown extension to an existing FIT scheme. So that is, that's a fruitful area, I think, to, uh, to, to explore. Um, completely different sources um, of income for renewables projects um, are uh, areas that perhaps have only been um, touched upon to date, um, storage, um, store contracts, capacity market payments, CFDs, um, power price arbitrage between storing power um, when it's generated at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, releasing it to the market at 8.30 in the evening when it, it's more expensive uh, and pushing it out through a, um, a STOD um, uh, PPA tariff. Um, these are areas that have not 
really been fully explored because to date uh, the subsidy has been sufficient um, and that um, uh, area of innovation ha hasn't really been needed to come through. I think it will come through strongly. Ancillary services uh, with DNOs. DNOs are trialing a whole series of uh, battery storage and other storage um, uh, uh, trials to see um, how they can operate their system more effectively and cope with the ups, ups and downs of frequency uh, and, and, and volume fluctuations. Um, they are fascinated um, by this particular play um, and the private sector has a huge opportunity to play within that um, uh, and to form um, close joint ventures with a series of um, uh, business organizations including the DNOs um, uh, so as to, uh, uh, to, to enter into longer term ancillary services arrangements. Now, they are not currently in existence. You know, trials are one thing, uh, but of course the industry is crying out for, but what am I going to do next summer? Um, and my question, I think, uh, would be, um, can these models be developed fast enough? They are coming. There are some very interesting proposals um, uh, out there which are being developed. They're in very early stage. They need to be accelerated and brought through so as to provide long-term financial security and long-term stream uh, security um, to projects going forward. Private wire opportunities, um, they've always been there. Um, they, are, they are challenging, uh, they are a bit messy, um, uh, but uh, we see that they will become even more important going forward um, to exploit the obvious um, uh, arbitrage between uh, the generation uh, price and export price um, as it's currently um, uh, specified under, under FITS, for instance, um, and the import price if you're buying power in from the grid, either commercially or residentially. There is a huge um, differential between those two uh, and private wire arrangements um, help exploit uh, those two. Um, there are a series of other smart grid opportunities. Um, there's triad chasing, etc. There, there are all kinds of different business models. Um, it's an exciting time. It's very heady and sweaty time um, uh, as those are being um, uh, pushed through really at, uh, at, 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 at great speed. I think um, my, my final question really to, to the industry um, would be they are exciting opportunities but can they be developed, can they be deployed in practice quickly enough um, to cope with the cliff edges uh, that the current proposals will inevitably create? Brilliant. Alan, thank you very much. Okay, so we're now going to move on to Seb. I'm delighted to have you here with us this morning as well, Seb. Um, and if you'd just like to um, give us your perspectives on, on, on what we've been talking about this morning so far. So, so over to you now. Yeah, thanks very much. I think um, Alan, of course, is absolutely right to um, try and focus the attention of the industry as well on the, the, the medium-term opportunities. Uh, but of course, you, you won't be surprised to hear me um, doing uh, something rather different to Alan's talk, which is absolutely to dwell on the significance of the next um, three to six months. Um, it seems to me that it's impossible actually to look at the current feeding tariff consultation um, in its entirety, unless you put it in the context of all the other things that have been going on since May the 8th. And as ever with our industry, um, you know, very often the changes that we have to endure and deal with, um, the thing that is most damaging from them is not so much actually over time the cuts to support, it's the way in which they're done and in particular the retrospective way in which they're done. Um, and uh, one of the reasons of course that the industry is, has been so outraged um, at the end of the summer by the feed and tariff consultation is absolutely because it came hot on the heels of of uh, very, very sudden announcements on an end to fit accreditation, an end to grandfathering under the RO and so on. The, the other thing I think it's really important to, to note, um, there was a very interesting headline I think last week on Solar Power Portal as a result of the uh, kicking which ministers received at the DEC oral question time last week and the headline began, officials under pressure. Um, um, I, I think it would be a big mistake for our industry to assume that the FIT review is just some sort of technocratic, official-driven exercise. It's, it's very clearly part of a pattern that's been set by the new government, and indeed, in many ways, it remind, reminds me of why I was 
quite so depressed on May the 8th because I think those of us who'd been following the political um, context for our sector for some time recognised that the election of a majority Conservative government uh, was going to bring some pretty tough times to our sector. Um, two final points from me. Um, uh, one is that we've of course been here many times before. Uh, I recall back in 2008 um, Labour ministers and officials telling us to basically sort of give up on the idea that we could ever have a feed-in tariff. Uh, extremely dismissive at the start of that a very long lobby which eventually delivered the feed-in tariff in the first place. Um, the same thing uh, and uh, perhaps a little uh, less known episode was immediately after the uh, last general election back in 2010. Um, there was actually an attempt then to uh, severely curtail the feed-in tariff, if not do away with it altogether, e even before it had barely begun. And uh, some people on the on may recall that there was quite a major lo lobby in the autumn of 2010 involving, um, you, you know, a wide coalition in terms of pushing back against that particular episode. So we, we've been here many times, and we're we're used to these kind of uh, episode, but I do I do sense that at the very beginning of uh, what is a five-year parliament with a majority Conservative government, that uh, this feels um, it really does feel like a political assault, and I think the industry and our many allies in the NGO world and indeed beyond uh, kind of get that now. And so um, the the, op the, op the optimistic uh, message at the end of this session is this: that um, I mean, uh, Jonathan already referred to. Um, the of the industry compared with previous uh, challenges, not least in terms of the size of the sector, the, the number of people who work in it, and so on. But but also a very wide coalition. Uh, everyone from you know the CBI, the Big Six through Energy UK, right through to the usual suspects, all, all basically pushing back on this issue um, of the feed-in tariff review and particularly the threat to actually close it as early as next January and that's a very significant moment. The government's looking incredibly isolated um, and indeed that um, that campaign grows from week to week. Uh, only today, um, 1010, the campaign organisation, uh, are launching a new campaign which we're helping to support along with others in the industry which is called keepfits.org. So I do urge you to we go and check out that website, keepfits.org, and see what's going on there. Um, so I absolutely endorse what Alan said about looking to the future. But of course, if we don't, if we don't get these next few months right, um, and we don't push the government back from its its current uh, position, uh, things look very, very grim indeed for the UK sector. And that's where I'd like to leave my opening remarks. Great, Seb. Thank you very much for for that. Um, I'm going to move us swiftly on now to our final presenter of this morning. That's Merlin Hyman, CEO of Region Southwest. Merlin, delighted to have you join us. Um, and if I can ask you to just give your input now for the next 10 minutes or so. Okay. Thank you very much, Rosie. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that. As I said, I'm Merlin Hyman, Chief Executive of Region. Um, uh, we're a for those who don't know us so well, we're a not-for-profit whose kind of mission is to use our expertise to support the development of the renewable energy sector. Um, and I was going to keep up the focus on the kind of policy and, and, and lobbying elements. Um, so I think just picking up on what Seb said, I think it is firstly important in, in thinking about influencing government. It's kind of you know one has to understand that there is a there's a right and a, a wrong way. Of, of going up about that, and it, it's important to kind of understand the way the government is thinking in order to target your messages. Um, the, the there's not really a lot of point to sit, uh, sitting back as an industry and moaning about government. You know, we have to understand why it's got to the point it's got at. I think as an industry, we probably have to accept uh, a certain amount of um, uh, you know, uh, reflect over the years as to whether we've got our messaging right and our influencing strategies right to to enable us to get to a point where, where we're at, where we're seeing a, a, a pretty broad-based attack on renewables. And I'd characterise at a sort of senior level of government, I think there's a general scepticism about renewables. Um, I think they see it 
generally the, the focus is on low energy bills are good for the economy and renewables are generally associated with kind of higher energy bills. Um, all seems a bit small uh, scale in terms of individuals. It's just a general, a general, not really, general skepticism. Um, and you can you can kind of just get the the feel of that from um, from uh, central government and from and from senior officials. And what that leads to is a very budget driven perspective at the moment. So to in, in an atmosphere of general skepticism about renewables around the cabinet table. Then 7.6 billion pounds spent on renewables sounds like a big number, and when it looks like you're going to overspend that number by a billion and a half or so, then that looks like an even bigger number. And so the the simplistic answer to that is just to say, right, let's just cut that. And that's really the message that's coming down through deck. It's just simply, you've got a budget, you've got to meet it, you've got to cut it any way you, you can. Um, so. Part of the lobbying game and the influencing is to try and sort of reopen the political space for that discussion. Um, and I do think, as I've said, we're beginning to see that. Uh, we start to be some rumours of, of Amber Rudd coming out with a more positive, for the forward-looking statement about what they are going to do for renewables sometime in the, in the sort of months to come in the run-up to, to Paris. Um, and again, as I said, there are some sort of nice, quite you know, dramatic tensions, if you like, that we can use at the moment in the uh, rather the contrast between the Chancellor turning up in Beijing with bucketfuls of cash to give to the Chinese to build a nuclear power station here, uh, with dramatic slashing of support for sort of households and British businesses, etc. Um, so the, important to understand that that at the, mo at the moment, as I say, the government is. Uh, pretty, just, just pretty closed, and we need to open up that political space if we're going to get them to shift. Um, talking to people out there about, you know, there's, you see quite a lot of people in the industry thinking, well, I've got a major challenge to my business. That's what I need to focus on. Uh, it doesn't really matter what I say. The government's not going to change its mind anyway. Um, so we need to focus on on new business models. Um, and I think to understand that's absolutely right. We all do. Alan's been very articulate about that. Um, Regen itself, we our renewable futures conference in November will focus on the kind of pathways to parity, if you like. Uh, we're looking at the innovations around new grid. We're running a, a trial called the Sunshine Tariff, looking at kind of demand side response switching, etc. Um, so, a lot of our effort clearly is going into that. But I think it would be a very big mistake for the industry not to step up and have a very strong voice at this moment. Almost whatever the outcome of the next few months, policy will remain very important to us. The energy market as a whole is a very policy, whatever the government says, it's very policy driven and dominated. So even if we don't have subsidies, lots of things government do you know, will make a big impact to the future of, of our sector. So, we, so uh, conclusion, we do need to continue that strong, r r strong voice. Um, so a lot of people ask us, you know, well, what do I do? How do I have a voice? I feel kind of isolated, you know, I don't quite know how to get my voice heard. And I think the key is to keep it simple. Um, the most effective action individual companies and community energy groups and all those involved can do is to work with their local MP or local MPs. Uh, that is the political system. Uh, in this government, particularly backbench Tory MPs have particular influence with a, you know, a low majority, etc. And they do respond to what you might call kind of you know, mail, mailbox action. How just how much contact are they getting on an issue? And I'd say at the moment that we that they're beginning to see some, but it hasn't reached what I would say critical mass at the moment. Um, Regen's produced a kind of lobby pack to kind of walk people through how to contact your MP and to work with them on information to give them. But it is really pretty simple. You can just simply ring up, you know, ring up the House of Commons, ask your MP, and then ask the Diary Secretary and say you want to come and see them. They, as a constituent, uh, MP is pretty duty bound to respond, and it's really very difficult for an MP to sit down with a mem with a company in their constituency saying what your government is doing is going to hit my company and cause job losses and not respond to that. Whether or not they agree with you actually is slightly beyond the point. It's almost their democratic duty to represent your voice. And what they can do is simply contact the minister and say, you know, companies in my constituency are concerned about the impact of what you're doing. Please, can you reconsider? 
Um, I think one other tip in, in doing that is to not underestimate the kind of ignorance of MPs on this issue. And that's not really being particularly critical. They have to cover a vast amount of topics, very little knowledge of the details. So try to keep it very simple. And just some really simple facts about how much renewables is actually costing. The fact that the fit is nine pounds on an average bill of about 1,400. Um, it's just, they probably won't be aware of that from the mood music. Contrasting the bills, uh, the, the, the impact of, of renewables with other energy costs. And Regen produced the renewable energy bills. The fax email that's up on our website along with our lobby pack under kind of news and resources which we sent round which has some of those figures all carefully referenced that you can refer to and use. Um, so I think that's, you know, if you, if you want to do kind of one thing, then contacting your local MP is the, would be the single most influential thing that we can all do. And if you genuinely got all the companies involved in the solar industry and the broader renewables industry contacting their MP with concerns, uh, that would have a massive impact. Um, we're, one thing Regen's doing is organizing a kind of day of action focused particularly on community energy groups, which we find particularly active in this space on the 16th of October, where we're encouraging them all to go and see their MP on the same day and then building some sort of social media and press and stuff around that. Um, so that, that so that there's more that we can do to bring together the voice. Um, the other thing is to carry on supporting organizations like Regen, STA, et cetera, et cetera, who are sort of pulling together the industry and trying to uh, coordinate lobbying and have an influence. So uh, you know, it's a it's a hard task, this, but uh, all working together. I do sense a little bit of momentum. Uh, Seb has pointed out some of the positive signs that we, we begin to see, but equally we should recognize that we've still got quite a long way to build the critical mass and the kind of pressure on local MPs that's going to result in a, a shift in the government, whether that's in the short-term policy or, or you know, in the kind of medium-term uh, support uh, for, for renewables uh, compared with other energy technologies. I think the final thing from my point of view is, it, is we should just remember uh, the global picture here. So renewables has grown very, very strongly, as we all know, in the last few years. And globally, you begin to hear really radical statements like the chief executive of Shell saying solar will be the backbone of the future of the energy system. Um, crossover year in 2013 with more renewables added than fossil fuel capacity, energy capacity. So for me, the genie is out the bottle. There is no doubt that over the next few years, globally, renewables will, will, will grow rapidly and become the dominant energy technology. Uh, in, in the future, um, the, you know, and so we, we, the question is how do we in the UK make sure we take a leading role in that and we uh, get through the next, the difficult next period of months and years with this, this, this government, uh, not that as an industry we have a, a, long, uh, a medium term extremely bright future. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay, Merlin, thank you very much for for rounding up the discussion there. Um, I'd now like to take a few uh, questions um, from uh, the listeners of the webinar. We've had some, we've had quite a few um, come in. I think generally they're sort of split between, um, you know, a, a more practical tone, you know, what can we, what can we really be doing? And, and, and then there's some which are more looking ahead, you know, where, where will the opportunities lie moving forward? So to begin with, um, one of, the key questions that's come up really is, is there a legal position for our industry, given the lack of compelling evidence presented by DEC and the overwhelming bias shown towards nuclear oil, or do we have to rely on political and public support to mount any challenge to our predicament? That's coming in from Justin Canning, and I'd like to start with um, Alan John from Osborne Clark on that, and then I think move to um, Jonathan Selwyn and Seb Berry, as to that you've been involved in legal action um, as representatives of private companies. So, Alan, you first. Is there a legal position for our industry, given the lack of compelling evidence? 
Uh, there, there's an awful lot to say, obviously, in response to that, and it's a very pertinent question. I think just two thoughts, and uh, Jonathan's already alluded to the fact um, that there has been success for the solar industry uh, in relation to fit changes in the past. Um, in proportion and perspective, of course, um, if we were to dust down what those changes were at the time, um, they, they are actually quite modest uh, in comparison with what is being currently proposed. Um, but there, there was extreme sensitivity um, on, on behalf of the government that they were found um, to have behaved improperly uh, and in a retrospective fashion. Now, with that precedent, um, it may not necessarily um, sway a particular court decision decision on particular challenges. Each challenge is going to be different and, and, and there will be circumstances um, uh, which will be different at the time uh, and the previous action will be distinguished um, uh, by its different facts. But the, the fact remains um, that no civil servant, no government minister um, would want um, to run um, a, a severe risk of going through that sort of experience again. Um, so. There, that, that is a very human um, issue um, uh, with, with that limited um, success, um, but within the specific industry to date. Um, the, the, other, the other point I would make um, is that it, it's quite interesting on the, uh, on the LEC challenge, the published information, so this is not um, speaking out of school, um, but the, uh, what, what has been um, uh, talked about there is it's very much a challenge on the, uh, the, the limited consultation, the process. Um, that uh, was uh, uh, apparently gone through um, uh, the removal of Lex um, uh, with, with uh, virtually well, with no consultation and with very short notice. The focus there seems to be on um, the process that was gone through and the lack of consultation and the lack of proper notice, not actually the removal um, of um, the uh, quasi-subsidy um, uh, in itself. Uh, so that, that is distinguishing, I think, um, um, b b uh, um, process um, against uh, actual the fundamental of the government's prerogative um, of, of being able to manage its budgets uh, in the way that it sees fit. So ch choosing, choosing um, your fight, um, choosing the, uh, the items to you know, really go for, um, but being buoyed up to an extent by the success um, of the past fit challenge. Thanks, Alan. Okay, and, and Jonathan? Uh, yes, just picking up that last point first, I think in terms of the fit pre accreditation announcement, um, that is the area that we're focusing on. So the Solar Trade Association and a number of other renewable energy trade bodies are seeking legal advice on uh, the way that the consultation uh, was conducted, obviously, over the summer, only four weeks. Uh, two and a half thousand responses, only 16 in favour, and still it uh, presses on regardless. So that's an element there. Um, us in Solar Century, Water and TGC took action over the closure of the RO uh, to large scale solar last summer. And um, it's fair to say if you read the court judgment, we had a very narrow defeat. But nevertheless, uh, we believe the action forced the government to water down its grace period criteria, which enabled many millions of uh, pounds of projects to actually get through under the grace period that wouldn't have otherwise done so. And um, we felt, therefore, it was uh, vindicated. But also, we are appealing it because it was a very narrow decision. And we think that the announcement over grandfathering and um, the banding review um, might have swayed the judge the other way if he had known that that was also in the offing. But as Seb said earlier, we're absolutely uh, convinced this retrospective action is unlawful um, because people have made investment decisions and the judge acknowledged that last year um, uh, saying that uh, you know people suffered material harm it was retrospective in nature um, but it was um, because the government had made these concessions that he was minded to think they had gone far enough to protect the investments um, so um, there are plenty of uh, companies out there who are examining the options for legal action over the RO over fit pre-accreditation, um, possibly not so much over the full fit consultation um, because there are um, and maybe on a technical basis uh, less opportunities uh, within that. Um, but uh, nevertheless, as I said earlier, it's an important element of uh, what the industry needs to do, which is uh, lobby, look at legal opportunities and uh, prepare for a future without fits. Brilliant. Okay, and, and Seb, just 
just over to you for a comment on that. Um, I'd also like to just throw in another question whilst whilst you have the, the microphone, and that's from Howard Williams. Do you believe that the damage to the renewable industry has wide implications to investor confidence in the UK generally? So if you could just pick up on, do we have a legal stance and then the damage yeah. to the industry more widely? Yeah, well, just on the second point first, uh, it's very clear that the, the one uh, Merlin talked about, what are the messages that, that, that sort of play out best with a, with a conservative government? And, and, and certainly this, this issue of the way they have completely mishandled, including uh, clear retrospective elements to the decisions and announcements that have already been taken since the election absolutely plays into a much bigger issue, which is about investor confidence in, in all infrastructure projects, actually, in the UK, not not just um, renew, renewable energy. And we and that's one of the reasons, I think, where, where we are beginning to see some Conservative voices now coming out very publicly, warning the government about the dangers of... Um, the way in which it's proceeding. On on the legal point, um, I mean, let, let's be clear, the action that was taken in October 11 was absolutely about the retrospective nature of that of that particular consultation. In, in, in our view, is absolutely an essential uh, step to take and, and, and uh, I believe uh, in the end gave us um, three years of relative stability under the feed, feeding tariff once it had been reset. So the issue uh, that, that was at stake then was very much this idea that um, a consultation could be launched um, setting a date which had a very material policy change. Um, in that case, you, you know, um, even before the um, consultation um, had concluded and the government had responded. In, in the case of the consultations we've seen announced since the May the 8th, the government's up to its old trick of having a um, a trigger date for change which is equivalent to the first day of the consultation and they do that obviously because they recognize that it has an immediate impact on on the market so we do think there is definitely um, at least a question to be asked and explored around the retrospective nature of uh, particularly the grandfathering issue on the small-scale RO and also as Jonathan's pointed out on the rushed um, end to fit accreditation and I think on that all we can say is if anybody listening wants to have a further discussion about that we perhaps we should do that um, we should do that offline brilliant okay we've just had a few questions come in um, more specifically around the community energy sector and I'm going to direct them first up Merlin Merlin the first one coming there from my, Nigel Farron, um, do you think the government will reinstate pre-accreditation and a community feed-in tariff um, for community energy projects? And then, you know, are shared ownership projects still viable? Um, I guess the point there being, can we still make use of spare capacity at existing sites? So if you could just share your thoughts on those two questions there. Okay, just, um, I mean, take the, the, the community um, point is first in terms of slightly kind of wider point is we're talking just now really a lot about the short term so there's, there's almost two lobbying strategies here and there's this what can we do right now to try and uh, have an impact to make mm -hmm. the changes less bad in the short term uh, to try and get some traction to try and use the kind of dramatic nature of what they're doing to highlight the government's position on renewables and the run up to Paris etc um, but I do think there's also we need to start thinking uh, sort of in the medium and, and longer term about how we rebuild political support because you know, have a, if we win legal actions about about um, process that that can be very important in the short term but that doesn't really answer those that longer term problem and, and I think there the industry needs to think long and hard about how to build a sector you know which it, which is quite a you know, a big change in energy in this country and the way energy is used and thought about and how to build that in a way that really builds popular support. And at the heart of that, I think, is around uh, the, the community energy sector. Um, therefore, I think you know, things like shared ownership, uh, probably people have worked incredibly hard to try and make that work um, when it's quite complicated. You need more parties involved uh, in the transactions. Um, but uh, some uh, some people are showing that they are making it work, and I hope that the sector will kind of make sure, will, you know, will keep the learning from that 
and to try and ensure that the communities uh, are positively involved in all large renewable energy projects uh, going forward. And I, I think that's as much about you know, self-interest as being the right thing to do. Um, the uh, also you know, broader thinking about our communication, the way we engage. Regen's running an arts and energy program, which we find very successful as a new way of reaching out to people and getting them to think about something which they find quite difficult to engage in and think about. All this is about building that pub, uh, that political and public support that we're going to need in the years in the in the years to come. I'm. Uh, I think we may see some positive changes to support community energy in in the next few months, but I suspect it'll be pretty small beer um, to answer Nigel's question directly. I think the government is really very focused on its cap and it's worried it'd quite like to do something about community energy, but it's worried that it might just open a loophole which it can't really control. So I it may be pre accreditation back, um, but it what well, you know, there'll be something but I don't think it's going to be a, a really a, a very material cha uh, change to, to benefit communities would be my best guess, unfortunately, at the moment. Can I just add something there, Jonathan, here? Um, one of the things that DEC uh, likes to do is a kind of divide and rule strategy, which is um, back in 2011, they were taking action against solar farm developers and uh, they managed to get the support of some elements of the smaller installer. Uh, community to say, well, uh, if, if, if it protects the fit budget for the smaller installs, then I'm all for cutting the larger ones, which um, uh, was, was um, maybe in hindsight uh, not the ideal approach. But um, on the community side, of course, um, a lot of commercial uh, businesses are working with the community organizations to put together uh, solar and other renewable projects. And uh, you know, there's a sense that um, maybe the government will give some concessions to the community energy sector and uh, then uh, they'll back off in terms of the criticism of the government. But um, we have to be realistic here. Um, if there's no installers around to install these, um, then uh, there won't be any community energy projects. So I think it's important that we all stand firm uh, as one against uh, the proposals um, because it, it impacts both on the uh, commercial sector but equally on the community sector. And we need to support the campaigns against it together. Can I jump in there as well, Seb, Seb here? Um, just, just on that, Jonathan's absolutely right. The, the other key thing, of course, to point out um, is that if you delve into the numbers in the feeding tariff impact assessment, um, what you discover, of course, is that the projected budget for spend on solar to 2018-19 is something in the order of £30 million. Pounds. Um, and it looks to me and to many people in the industry that most of that, the assumption that most of that will be will be spent over this next period up to the end of this financial year. So in other words, unless we win the uh, political battles, and I, and I hear what Merlin says about the the bigger picture and, and looking forward, but, but frankly, if we don't win the pol political battles over the coming months in terms of a slightly uh, larger slice of the, of the cake, as it were, um, I mean, we are uh, literally looking at the potential closure of the feeding tariff scheme in its entirety. And if you ally that to the other changes that we know have already been announced, and indeed the ongoing delay to the CFD auction process, um, it's a pretty grim short-term picture. So that's why um, you know people like myself are focusing 100% on the on the short-term battles that we that we absolutely have to win. Alan, any final comments from you before before we close? No, just a, just a very brief one about investor confidence. Um, perhaps if I can just come back to that, uh, mm. the money, um, uh, if, if you're going to keep the money in the UK, um, then uh, we have got to, as, as Seb says and as everybody has said, we've got to win the, the immediate battles because the money is not going to hang around um, to see how perhaps the new business models that I was talking about um, will eventually work through. That money has to be deployed somewhere. Uh, we're now 11th, I think, in the world um, in terms of the Ernst & Young attractiveness um, index. So we've dropped um, out of the, the top 10 for the first time. The US is right up there um, in pole position. Uh, the US is a good place to do business and therefore inevitably uh, renewables money um, is going to be attracted um, to where it is um, seen to be, perceived to be best to do business. Um, 13 investors, didn't they, uh, wrote a, a letter to, to George Osborne on the 11th of September. Um, this is UK um, complaining about the quasi-retrospective effect of the uh, of, of the proposals, 
um, if we if we don't actually get change, immediate change, uh, and immediate reassurance that the UK is a, still a good place to do renewables and particularly solar business, um, then inevitably the money is going to look elsewhere. If the money goes elsewhere, then of course that, that hits the heart of the industry. Brilliant. Okay, th thank you very much. I'm going to wrap up there. Um, I know that 10 o'clock was, 11 o'clock was the was the finishing time. So I just wanted to say thank you very much to to you, Alan, Merlin, Jonathan, and Seb for joining us, and for everyone who's who sent in questions. As I said at the beginning, the t webinar was recorded, and so you'll be able to share that with with friends and colleagues. Um, do get in touch with with any further questions that you have or ideas for future webinars. I think this discussion will be carried on at Solar Energy UK um, in October. Um, I know that uh, Merlin and, and Jonathan are, are, are speaking at, at the exhibition there, so do register and, and join us in Birmingham for that. Um, and just, just a final note from me that, that tomorrow we have um, another webinar um, focused more at the installer market, so looking at different ways in which installers can diversify, and we're joined with Chris Jardine from Joju Solar. Simon Daniels from uh, Moxa Technology and Jerry Hamilton from Rexel UK, so, so do sign up for that. Apologies for the initial um, technical issues, it's one of the first web webinars that we have run. But I just want to say thank you all very much for joining me this morning um, and keep an eye out for future webinars that, that we run. Thank you. <laughs>